Today, we will go through an interactive activity simulating real life design, construction and commissioning decisions and see how those decisions we make can impact our operations. The information included in this interactive activity is given in good faith but without liability on the part of iChemE or the iChemE Safety Centre. We are going to assist in the start-up of an underground coal mine. The team creating this underground coal mine could be described as a little inexperienced, so we're going to help them make some decisions along the way. We're going to make these decisions at each stage and then step through the construction and commissioning. Before each stage, we will hold a team meeting to make decisions for the next stage. Our company is the majority shareholder, but to have the money to fully fund the design and construction, we've had to run a share float. So far we've spent $64 million to develop the road access infrastructure, the underground stone drift and the surface infrastructure. Today is a very exciting day because we raised a further $143 million for the final design and construction. This did require the sale of 49% of our holdings in the company. Very importantly, we have two years to complete the design and construction as we have to be at steady state hydro mining at the end of two years or face significant financial penalties. During this activity, we will refer to this share float as day one. We have a management team at the mining company, a mine manager, financial controller, safety officer, foreman, environmental manager and ventilation engineer. Now, because our company is still quite small, the mining manager will actually fill the role of the ventilation engineer. For this activity, we'll be supporting the mine manager with the decisions required to develop the mine. These are the decisions we're going to be making along the way. Looking at our financial planning to date, you can see our starting point, which is today. We've spent our $63 million establishing the mine. We've had to raise $143 million from the sell-off of our shares, so this is our money to finish the project. In our second year, the cash flow will remain negative. We will mine a small amount of coal, about 24,000 tonne. This will be in the development of the roadways and infrastructure. At the end of two years, we will move to steady state mining with the hydro mining technique. The mine is estimated to produce 1 million tonne of coal in the third year and have positive cash flows for the remainder of the life of the mine, which is estimated to be about 20 years. So our next task is to create the ventilation shaft as shown. There are a number of methods that can be used to develop the ventilation shaft. We will review four of these methods and later you'll be involved in the decision process. So we need to create this 4.2 metre diameter ventilation shaft. Our four options are to use blind sink mining, LMAC mining, raising bore or to create a second mine entrance. Option one is the blind sink. This is where we blast down from the surface of the mountain to the mine shaft underneath. This is probably the safest method to achieve our objective of creating a ventilation shaft. However, this is a very slow method. We will also have problems removing the excavated earth as there's no roadway to the top of the mountain, so we may need to develop one. We will need treatment ponds and other major infrastructure as well. If we choose this option, we would need to go back and request approval from the Conservation Authority, which will result in delays. This is time we can't afford. Option two is LMAC mining. This is where drilling is undertaken from the drill deck on top of a raised climber. When drilling is completed, the face is charged with explosives. The raised climber is then lowered to the bottom of the raise and into a station for protection before the blast is triggered from a safe location. The LMAC system provides for efficient post-blast ventilation and a powerful air and water blast effectively dislodging loose rock from the freshly blasted surface making it ready for re-entry. The earth is excavated from within the mine, so we don't need to build any new roads or infrastructure. It's a practical method given the soft earth because we can reinforce it as the sides go up. It's very prudent in our rock conditions. This method has been recommended by our contractor, but it is not the fastest or the cheapest method available. We can't afford significant cost or delays. Option three is the raised bore method. This is where we use a bore drill and drill down the 100 metres into the mountain and down to the mine tunnel. We then bring in a large mechanical reamer into the shaft and attach it to the raising bore drill. This then slowly raises, mechanically creating the shaft. This is not great in the soil we've got, 
because you can't reinforce the sides until the reamer is drawn all the way up to the surface. So it does leave open the possibility of rock falls. But this is a fast method and the lowest cost method because we can use our current infrastructure. This could help us claw back some time and money. Option four is a second tunnel. This would be the creation of a second entrance into the mine and would provide a second exit point in case of emergency. It's a safe method and it would be really great to have a second entrance. Unfortunately, this method is very slow. As we saw with our first entrance, it took twice as long as expected and cost twice as much. This method would cause large delays and add significant costs. So the summary information we have so far. The construction of the main entrance took 18 months and came in over double the budget. A new share market float was required and this raised an additional $140 million. We need to make a choice around how we construct our ventilation shaft. There are four options, the blind sink, LMAC mining, raising bore or a second mine shaft. Now we get to make a decision. What we'd like you to do is review the four options that have been proposed and sign off for the different functions. There is a handout where you can either tick yes I think the function would recommend this or cross for no I don't think the function would recommend this. You can tick or cross multiple options. We'll then come back and see what the mine manager chose to do. So we talked to the night shift about what's happened and we learned that it's been a quiet night. There's a large flow rate due to orders that are in the system and column one is running a bit cold due to high demand, but otherwise there are no operational issues. The night shift have said that column one is running a little bit cold. So we want to take a look at that before the official handover. We're going to focus in on the area highlighted in the yellow box. Now we actually know why column one is running cold. That's due to six years earlier, a condensate transfer from this plant to another gas plant was introduced. A hazard study was undertaken, but it only focused on the pipe connecting the two plants and not how the plants may interact together. This change means that it was necessary to operate column one at a lower than normal temperature. That is minus 20 to minus 25 degrees C rather than minus 10 degrees C. This caused the temperature instrumentation to override the column one level control more frequently. Consequently, this raised the level of condensate in the base of column one. Accompanying these conditions was an increase in the frequency of warning alarms. These were for the high level condensate. These alarms were tolerated. So here is our process. We have column one, which has a normal condensate level shown here. The condensate flows out through the valve through the heat exchanger and off to a different gas plant. The exit set point from heat exchanger four is one degree C. So if the temperature in column one is too low and the product exiting heat exchanger four is less than one degree C, the outlet of column one is closed to reduce the flow into the heat exchanger. The consequence that this has on column one, it raises the condensate level in column one so that it rises above the 100% level. This cools down column one, as we mentioned, from its normal minus 10 degrees to a new minus 20 to minus 25 degrees. When the level goes above 100%, product flows out the overflow line into the flash tank where it flashes and drops the temperature there from a normal minus 23 degrees to a new minus 33 degrees. Now we've gone to look at the chart to see what's happening in column one. Here we have the column one level shown over a week's period. You can see that normally the condensate level is 55%. There have been a number of small disturbances in the last seven days, a few times reaching up to 100%. In the last 38 hours, the level has jumped to 100% and stayed there for 33 of those 38 hours. All of the instruments that we have in the plant are linked to an audible signal. Once activated, an alarm must be acknowledged or silenced on the control panel. However, the alarm will stay active until the process conditions return to normal. It must be reset manually once the process is back in normal operating conditions. And it's not unusual for a large number of alarms to be active at any given point. We've talked to the other operators to understand what's going on. 
It was relatively common practice for the columns to be operated with condensate levels in alarm. Column 1 could run above 100% for hours in that mode. Last night was an example. The other operators did not react to the alarms because they saw them as a normal situation. So our summary of information so far is that our plant manager, supervisor and engineers are all off-site this morning. We know that column 1 is running above 100% condensate level and has been for quite some time due to the modification made six years earlier. The alarms are silenced but they're still a bit of a nuisance and the operators believe this to be a normal operating condition. So now we get to make a decision. Before we undertake the handover, we've got four options we can take. We can decide to continue to monitor the situation, to call our supervisor, to call the plant manager, or to shut the plant down. What we'd like you to firstly decide is what do you think the operators will do, given the information that you have? And secondly, what would you do, given the information you have? Discuss if there's any difference here. Then we'll come back and see the action taken by our operations team. So now we go back to our handover sheet. We've written the tank levels and we're also going to compare these with the levels that we had at 340. We may still have to wait a little while because there's still some tankers filling so we will do the final recording just before 7am. We'll also have to wait on filling in the final volume pumped down pipeline 1. We've recorded the hazards and we've added a new note regarding Bund 3 which has a slight leak and it looks to be slowly increasing. And there are no changes to the overtime details we put in earlier. We've closed out the action from the last shift regarding the bunding. We've had a look at Bund 3 and investigated the leak. It appears to be rainwater has found a path through one of the joints. The buns are supposed to be water and fireproof but in reality some of the joints leak on some of the buns. And there are cracks from movement as well. In the event of a tank leaking, the bund is there to prevent the contents from spreading. Each bund must contain at least the full contents of the largest tank and a safety margin. Bund 3 is shown here highlighted in red. Bund 3 contains tanks T4, T5, T6, T7 and T8. It's owned by the Northern Company, that's us. The bunds are constructed with concrete and the joints are sealed as well as sealing where any pipes pass through the bund walls. You've checked bund 3 and you can see that it has small leaks in three locations where water has found a small path. The bund doesn't seem to have proper stops, just relying on the sealant, and the sealant seems to have failed over time. This is the type of item that needs to be added into that operations maintenance book to be repaired. You've just received an urgent phone call from your family. Your son has been in a late night car accident. He's okay, but he's been taken to hospital. As soon as your shift finishes, you need to drive 45 minutes to get to the hospital. It's now been two hours since you wrote down the levels and which tanks were being filled and emptied. You've now written down the levels at 6am and even colour coded them to show the status of the tanks. Green means it's emptying, yellow means no change and red means it's filling. There's only one tank that's gained in level and that's tank 4. Tank T4 is holding unleaded petrol and has an 81% tank level. You compare it to the earlier handover sheet from 7pm and tank T4 was at 89%. Frustratingly, it's not so obvious if this is the tank that's being filled by Pipeline 2 or Pipeline 3 or whether a tank is being filled at all. Once again, you're relying on the alarms. You've been unable to work out which tank is filling. This is frustrating and you're annoyed at the system. It's so difficult to navigate. You now have to wait for the alarm to alert you which tank is filling. There is an alarm on the high level gauge at least. There's also the instrumented high level stop, which will stop the tank from overfilling. Even if it does overfill, it'll collect in the bund. These systems give you confidence that nothing can happen. So a summary of where we're at right now. Your son's been in a car accident and you've received an urgent phone call from your family. He's okay, but he's been taken to hospital. As soon as your shift finishes, you need to drive 45 minutes to get to the hospital. You've checked out Bund 3, which is leaking. You need to remember to add bunding failures to the operations maintenance book in the hope that it'll get fixed. You've not worked out which tank is filling from Pipeline 2 or Pipeline 3, or whether any tank is filling at all. You're relying on the alarms. Now we get to make another decision. We're still not sure which tank is filling from either Pipeline 2 or Pipeline 3. 
to assist you in making this decision will provide you with the final handover sheet. There are four options we can take. We can await the alarm. We can investigate further by looking through the tanks and going out to the tanks to evaluate. We can call the Southern and Eastern Operations team and ask, or we could initiate an emergency shutdown. We'd like you to select what decision you think the supervisor will make. Then what decision would you make? Is there any differences here? We'd also like you to review the handover sheets and write down which tank you believe is filling given the information we've got. And we'll come back shortly to see what the operators did. This is a different way to present a case study. It was done this way in an attempt to remove hindsight bias. We often fall into the trap of thinking an incident would not happen to us because we are smarter and would not have made the decisions which led to the incident. In short, we just don't believe it could happen to us. This activity gives us a chance to experience the event without experiencing the consequences. It's useful to reflect on the decisions that you made and how they've impacted the situation, as well as what you have learnt from this experience.